Charles II comes back in May 1660, and one of the issues that he has to sort out on his restoration is what are we going to do about the Church of England? Because the Church of England had been effectively abolished, certainly with bishops, from the early 1640s, which is why the Westminster Assembly of Divines was called at Westminster Abbey in order to advise on what the makeup uh, of the Church of England should be without bishops. Now, of course, the bishops had all supported uh, Charles II and his father, Charles I, in the English Civil War. So uh, they had suffered then, and the royalist supporters among the, the clergy had suffered uh, throughout the Puritan ascendancy and the interregnum. And so when um, Charles II comes back, um, clearly there are political issues to be sorted out as well. So the calling of a conference at the Palace of the Savoy in 1660 to organise the Restoration Church of England is crucial. The Lord Chancellor, who Sir Edward Hyde at that time, not quite yet, Lord Clarendon, is sitting in on it. Uh, Archbishop Lord had been executed in 1645, so he wasn't around to argue the toss. You've got Bishop Juxon, who then becomes Archbishop, who was Bishop of London, and he's the most senior clergyman, and, and other uh, Anglican clerics. But um, the first uh, parliament, um, which uh, Charles calls, um, is, off, is interestingly composed very much of younger men. And younger men who have seen their estates taken from them um, by the Cromwellian party, um, and whose parents have suffered, and basically they want revenge. And so there's a, a, a definite element of revenge in what effectively is a Laudian Church of England, which is established in 1662. Um, Baxter and his friends are arguing at the Savoy Palace for uh, a more comprehensive, they would argue, more comprehensive Church of England, rather than the narrow Laudian High Church view but I'm afraid the revenge element win the day. And so Baxter and his fellow, and he would not have called himself a Presbyterian, but people who would, I mean, they might have settled for bishops. What they wouldn't have settled for is bishops by jure divino, by divine law. They'd have settled for them if they were by civil law established. And Baxter himself was offered a bishopric of Hereford and Worcester, but he turned it down. Of course, his friend, Reynolds, uh, also effectively a Presbyterian, accepted and, and became Bishop of Norwich and then looked around and found all his friends were ejected ministers. So he found himself, curiously, with this Episcopal chair in the uh, Church of England, which was not really to his liking. So that's effectively the beginning of English denominations, 1662, the Act of Uniformity. So the people who couldn't conform to the Act of Uniformity were non-conformists. The mistake that was made, uh, perhaps by Charles II, certainly by Baxter's colleagues, was to allow George Morley, Bishop George Morley, to head up the prelates' delegation and to allow Baxter to head up the Presbyterian delegation. Morley was on record as already having refused Baxter permission to preach and refusing to give him licence, and Baxter took umbrage at that. Morley disliked Baxter on account of the fact that Baxter had become notorious by the early restoration for having printed and published The Holy Commonwealth, which was a book published in 1659, um, advocating Richard Cromwell's rule as possibly the, the solution to the constitutional and religious difficulties and turmoil of the 1640s and the 1650s, and justifying Baxter's decision to fight, or at least become a chaplain, on behalf of the parliamentary army um, rather than the, the royalist army. So it was a notorious text come the Restoration, and Morley in particular loathed it. He does not have the, that gift of political felicity. He, he does not have the gift of smooth words. Uh, he doesn't quite appreciate how he comes across. He does know that in his writing he can sound too severe and heated towards those he's writing against. Um, but but I, don't, I don't think he quite appreciates the extent to which he is not heard by 
those that he's trying to reach. And it gets to the point, I think, in the, in the late 1650s, where actually, if, if he were to propose something, then there are others who would propose the opposite just because he's proposing it. So he, he generates an enormous amount of antagonism. And, and in the Reliquiae, he says, I did that deliberately in the sense that I chose to put myself out in front with the support of my colleagues, but I chose to put myself out in front. I chose to um, make me the main speaker so that I would draw that dislike on myself and spare my colleagues. But there's something going on in there that there's, there's, there's a lack of self-awareness in Baxter at times, and he doesn't quite see how actually he's not helping the cause. And I think one of the blind spots of the Reliquii is that Baxter doesn't see how in the Savoy negotiations of 1661, he is not the best man for the job. He should not be the one who's leading those negotiations. He t he's too much of a dogmatic and oblivious personality. He's, he's too much of a dog with a bone. Uh, and he, he doesn't have the gift of reaching others in a way that can bring about compromise. Arguably, no one was interested in compromise. Of course, there is a creation of indulgence in 1672 from Charles II. Basically, it was thought perhaps to appease the Catholics, but in, in order to do so, he had to include the Protestant dissenters as well, Protestant nonconformists, so that um, Baxter and, and other nonconformists could legally, for a few months, register uh, either themselves as ministers and the place of worship, possibly their home or some other place, as where they could meet. And then that declaration offers us a glimpse into what uh, nonconformity is doing in, the, in the Charles II's reign. But then it only lasts a few months and it's taken away. But we, we do have all the papers then that people registered. And he would not register himself, Baxter, as under any denomination. So he wouldn't put himself down as a Presbyterian. He only would register himself once he negotiated that he could simply be a mere non-conforming minister. And in fact, on the piece of paper it says non-conforming minister. That's all. For the rest of his life he attended the parish church. So he would go there, but he wouldn't preach. He couldn't preach. When he lived in Acton, his habit was to go to the parish church in the morning and then preach at home to his family, servants, a few neighbours. And of course the problem was he ended up getting quite a group of people. <laughs> he too many people and the local uh, rector didn't like that. And uh, so Baxter is arrested.